Welcome to episode 62 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast. Day of the Dove. In this week's episode, an alien that thrives on conflict lures the Enterprise and a Klingon ship to its planet, before forcing both crews aboard the Federation vessel to enact a perfectly balanced jingoistic war for its own sustenance. With a cessation of hostilities the only hope, can Kirk persuade his adversary to stand down or will he be locked in battle forevermore? I understand, Doctor. I too felt a brief surge of racial bigotry. Most distasteful. Good evening, Ian. How are you? I'm not too bad, Jay. How are you? Ah, I'm feeling a surge of racial bigotry at the moment. Which races are you picking it against? Can't possibly say. I don't like the 10,000 metres. It takes too long. <laughs> to put the water jump in, that one would be better. Yeah. How are things, anyway? Not too bad. A bit warm. Really? Yeah. Not as bad as it is in the, the States at the moment. No, we can't complain. Baking over there. Yeah, and Canada. Yeah, unfortunate for them. And India, I think. If only they would control their pollution. Not them specifically, just everybody. Shall we just get into the episode? Yeah, then? let's just, let's crack on. We begin on a planet's surface where Kirk, McCoy, Chekhov and a red shirt are scouting around. It's an immediate beam down. They have their phasers drawn. They look quite tense. We discern from what they're saying that a colony has been destroyed. Yeah, there are no life readings, but McCoy reminds Kirk that they got a message from a group claiming they were being attacked by an unidentified ship. Chekhov, however, notes that they didn't identify any ship on their way here. And Kirk's anger rises as he points out that a hundred men and women and children of the settlement have been wiped out and wants to know by who. And at this we see a, a floating entity behind them. It seems to be some kind of relative of the one that we saw with Sif from Cochrane. Is that the gas cloud? Yeah, with yeah. the multicoloured mm -hmm. changes. And it went red when it was angry. Yeah, I'm sure they've been using the same technology. Well, we'll get to that. At this, Spock comes on comms, reporting that there's a Klingon ship on approach. So Kirk orders a red alert and tells Spock to protect the ship as a priority. And he's now certain that these Klingons are who has caused the massacre on the planet. However, Sully notices that the Klingon ship is in trouble with explosions on board and Spock tells him that it is totally disabled even though they didn't fire on it. Yes, and at this we see five furious Klingons beam down to the planet's surface. They storm over and their leader strikes Kirk to the ground, accusing him of ordering an attack on their ship that caused the death of 400 of his crew. Whoa. Yes, he says that the Enterprise and the landing party are now his prisoners after this act of war. And we see the swirling entity hovering nearby. And then the credits. Yeah, a little pervert, a little peeping Tom. Well, it's feeding on it, isn't it? We don't know that yet. Don't give away. Spoilers, please. Okay. Yeah, credits and then back down to the planet. It remains unnoticed when we return. And here Kang, the Klingon leader, argue with his captives. Three years, the Federation and the Klingon Empire have been at peace. A treaty we have honored to the letter. We took no action against your ship, Kang. Were the screams of my crew imaginary? What were your orders, Kirk? To start a war, you've succeeded. To test the new weapon? We shall be happy to examine it. There was a Federation colony on this planet. It was destroyed. By what? No bodies, no ruins. A colony of the invisible? Yes test of a new Klingon weapon, leaving no traces. Federation ships don't specialize in sneak attacks. We have wondered when you would begin. You lured my ship into ambush by a false Klingon distress call. You will tell us why with a proper persuasion. You received a distress call. We received a distress call. I don't propose to spend the rest of my life on this ball of dust arguing your fantasies. The Enterprise is mine. <laughs> Instruct your transporter room to beam us aboard. Go to the devil. We have no devil, Kirk. But we understand. 
understand the habits of yours. I shall torture you to death, one by one, until your noble captain cries enough. Who will be first? I thought Kirk gave in quite quickly there. Yeah, well, Chekhov gets tortured for about three seconds before Kirk panics. And In this episode, Chekhov deserves a good torturing. He will do a wee bit later, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Go to the Devil is the studio-friendly version of Go to Hell. Yes. Yeah, in this situation, and we've seen before, Kirk, the priority should be the Enterprise and the crew on, on board that. They shouldn't really be giving in to this threat of torture. Certainly not straight away. In any case, the tension is broken by an outraged Chekhov who has to be held back from attacking Kang because he claims that he killed his brother. Or not personally, but the Klingons killed his brother. Yeah. Now, I was taking these notes real time and I asked the question, is this the only mention of Chekhov's brother? No, no, he'll come back up later on. Okay. And it's very specific as well. It's not just that he's got this brother, but apparently he died on a Canis 4 as a research outpost. That's quite a... Yeah, a, a, it must be a real attack or re- reference to a real thing. Mm. Along with a hundred others. It's not just his his brother. Yeah. Kang is unmoved, however. Yes, so then we get the torture that we referred to earlier on. Yeah. That Kirk doesn't stand up to for very long. And McCoy is outraged at the idea that Kirk's about to hand over the Enterprise. I agree. Although he would say that he's not the one being face tortured. That's true. He's told just to shut up and mind Chekhov. And Kang warns Kirk at this stage not to try anything. But Kirk promises no tricks. Once they're on the Enterprise. Yeah. Kang at this gives him the communicator and taunts him for his weakness. Yes, he is doing something a Klingon never would have. Chekhov calls the Klingons animals and Kang says it's your captain who's come crawling like an animal. (laughs) Nice. So Kirk gives Spock the order to beam everybody up, but there's also a non-verbal signal sent from the communicator. Yes, which is picked up and understood. And never used in any other episode, nor referenced. And in fact, in the past, when they've had to do this, they do it verbally. Right. Remember Scotty got the code, coded message? Yes, yes. Anyway, they get beamed up, and by the looks of it, they are joined by the entity. Yes, it's on its way. To the transporter room, Kirk's warning has worked, and whilst... Our guys arrive as normal. The Klingons have been suspended in transit. Yes, they're on their way, but it's going to take a bit longer. Again, is that something that's been done before? It would have been quite useful. Yeah, I'm not sure it's been done before. It does get done again. Okay. Maybe not in this series. I'm not sure. What does Chekhov suggest? Leaving them there. Uh, Just let them um, disappear, essentially. Yes, he says that as security arrive. And Kirk has their guests beamed in and immediately disarmed. It's still a bit of a risk. Yes, they could start shooting. Mm-hmm. Kang at this accuses Kirk of being a liar. However, Kirk has got him on a technicality. Yes, wordplay. What was it? Uh, the trick came before they reached the ship, not after. Ah, sly. So Kang must accept it as honourable. Mm. They are now prisoners of the Federation for possible acts of war. And as Kang protests that... There are still survivors on his ship. Scotty appears with some news. Yes, the Klingon ship is so radioactive it's a hazard to the entire region. And also the hailing frequencies have been blocked. So Kirk orders the destruction of the Klingon ship and Kang notes this is him finishing the job he started. But it is not quite as cold a decision as it appears. Why is that? Well, we now start to see the other surviving Klingons beamed aboard the Enterprise in batches. Yes, which include... The science officer and Kang's wife, Mara. Yes, she is terrified because she's heard all about the Federation's death camps and their atrocities. However, Kirk insists that they will all be well treated and are in fact led to a a crew lounge, not to the the brig. No, and the food dispensers are to be programmed with Klingon friendly. Knowing what they know about the Klingons, why would you not put them in the brig? Why would you let them... Well, they've disarmed them. They're no threat. Really? Well. Okay. And who's putting forward this propaganda? Just other Klingons? Well, it's war time, isn't it? Or Cold War time. Mm -hmm. Kang actually notes the courtesy of the 
accommodation before he heads out. Does he? Yeah. Okay. In the corridor, as they walk, Kirk gives instructions and wants to know what has happened. But the impudent Chekhov sneers that they know what has happened. He has a wee arse in this episode. Oh, I can't. I know he's under the influence of other things, but they should have had him ejected into space for some. I think I said it last week. I, I would not be entirely aggrieved if Chekhov met his maker. I mean, he, he is primarily an irritant. Yeah. But anyway. I think he's meant to be sort of cute. Is he? Well, yeah, I think he is. He's small stature and he's sort of chirpy little smile, his boyish little yeah. mannerisms. I mean, but try and work it if in the analogy, if this is a Cold War situation, who is he? Is he the guy that's out there saying, yeah, let's blow up the Russians? Oh yeah, he's somebody with uh, who's got a bloodlust. I hate the commies. Mm -hmm. You know what commies are like. Yeah. Can't trust any of them. Nope, let's slaughter them. Mm. A war criminal. Or potentially. Or well, he's about to act like one. Or a Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, Spock notes that um, this is garbage. The Klingons had no opportunity to attack the colony. They didn't arrive until well after that. And they too were attracted by a distress call. And again, behind them we see the entity swirl around. So in the turbo lift, Chekhov is still too stupid to be quiet and insists that they are behind things. He talks a lot for someone of such a low rank when he's in the captain's company. Yeah, as I said earlier, he's very impudent. He's keep his mouth shut absolutely and he gets some support from mccoy who is isn't interested in proof as he knows what klingons are he's a bit of a racist as well it's the same sort of thing isn't it yeah now at this point mccoy gets out yes spock notes to kirk that their ship's logs will vindicate them against any accusations but kirk quite um insightfully notes that they might not be believed no, you could certainly uh, fake them, I suppose. That's happened already in this show before. Yeah. Up on the bridge, Ahura briefs Kirk on their arrival that there is still no contact with Starfleet Command. And he tells her to keep trying as they have a, a diplomatic tiger by the tail. I like that expression. <laughs> Scotty calls up from engineering to advise that the Kling or from transporter room, presumably, to advise that the Klingon ship has now been evacuated. So Kirk has Sulu blow it up. Yeah, um, now I'm not sure how, if that's how radiation works. Yeah, you just blow up and therefore it's no longer radioactive. I'm thinking that might just spread the radiation around the place. Well, maybe taking it away from a central area to disperse is reducing the risk enough. You don't know how radiation works either, do you? Well, space is full of radiation, it can't make it that much worse. Okay. In any case, they change course at warp 3. Not that fast. No. We've just blown up some radiation. Just let's meander out of here. Yeah, we'll, we'll take the standard <laughs> route. In in the, <laughs> we get a direction, but I don't know where it is they're heading. They don't say. No. And in the corridor, we see the entity creeping about again. Before we head to the crew lounge. Klingons aren't very happy. No, Kang is pacing and threatening what he will have done to Kirk once he's taken power. But Mara, she's less confident. She is. But Kang tells her they will be kept alive for questioning and they will have an opportunity to take the ship. Mm. Although she points out that they are 40 against 400. And that's another Klingon. I don't think we get his name. But he pipes up and states that 4,000 throats can be slit in one night by a running man. That's a well-known phrase in the Klingon era. Yeah. <laughs> pretty grim. Still running pretty fast. And also, in 300 years in the future, they're killing lots of people by knife. Mm. Maybe it's a turn of phrase. Yeah, perhaps. But again, the turn of phrase, you're using a turn of phrase which would have been appropriate hundreds of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, we, we do do that though sometimes. We do. Quid pro quo. Swing the axe or something like that, yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. However, Kang wants patience and thinks that taking control of the Enterprise will allow them to end things swiftly. Up on the bridge we see the the alien creature again up near the roof. Yeah, Ahura, she's agitated. Well, she's uncharacteristically short-tempered. She still can't get any outside communications and then they seem to come under attack. Well, certainly there's a, a shake and a light going out moment. Uh, they've changed course and now they are accelerating and as often happens, Sulu has no control over it. He's useless as well. Yeah, he's always losing control. He has one line in this episode that Either it irritated me or I, I liked. I'll get to that. Okay. He's got more to say in this episode than he has for a while. 
His agent must have been pushing for that. <laughs> I need a bonus this week, give me five lines. From engineering we hear Scotty. Yes, he's asked to stop the engines but reports that he can't. The ship is accelerating by itself to warp nine. And they realise that the new course is going to take them out of the galaxy. Worse still, the bulkheads have closed with 400 crew trapped below. That's unfortunate. It's a little bit like the Titanic or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't even know what a bulkhead is. What is a bulkhead? It's like a permanent block on the routes between the two parts of the ship. Yeah, okay. So down in the crew lounge where the Klingons are hanging out, Kirk is talking to Kang and for some reason has given him all the strategic information about the situation on board. Tell me about it. Well, he's told them about the men being blocked off, he's told them about the losing control of the helm and the fact that they don't know how to stop the ship. Yeah, and Kang, he, he smirks at the accusation that they are somehow behind all of this. And so Kirk orders a red shirt to get down and see if any Klingons are on board, any other Klingons that they haven't been aware of. Yes, and then tells Kang that he owes him something before he heads to the brig and punches him in the face. What was that for? Because Kang punched him earlier. Yeah, I'm okay, but so I suppose there's time and a place to get your revenge. This probably isn't there a lot of trouble. Yeah, it's unnecessary. And suddenly Kang has a sword. Yeah, they all do. All the all the weapons have changed. Yeah, all the flowers and weapons and everything else in the room have become swords. So everyone stands there for a moment, looking quite confused before fighting breaks out. Yeah, they end up battling into the corridor before Kirk. And the red shirts manage to escape with one of them injured and head into the turbo lift. They head to sickbay where Johnson, the red shirt, is carried out while Kirk continues on to the bridge. Where he lets them know the Klingons are free and communicates with Scotty to try and get the trapped crewmen released from below and do whatever needs to be done. Yes, yeah, Scotty confirms there are 392 people down below and he's told to check the armory protect engineering and the auxiliary controls but he says that there's no point to trying to free these men because the doors and the bulkheads won't respond and you'd have to phaser them out mm. so Kirk asks for five minute reports that's quite a lot every five minutes yeah, you let him do his work mm -hmm. he then orders the ship to be scanned to keep an eye on the Klingons and their movement but Spock doesn't necessarily see them as the primary concern Captain, neither the Klingon technology nor ours is capable of this. The instantaneous transmutation of matter. I doubt that they are responsible. Any other logical candidate? None. However, if they had such power, would they not have used it to create more effective weapons? And only for themselves. Sir Sulu, get below. Take command of engineering and auxiliary control. I see. Captain. Chekhov? Mr. Chekhov, as you were. Chekhov, sir! Let me go, too. I've got the personal score to settle with the Klingons. This is no time for a vendetta. Maintain your post. Captain! Chekhov, maintain your post! Don't try to stop me, Captain. I saw what they left of Pyotr. When I swore on his grave, I would avenge his murder. What's Chekhov's grudge against the Klingons? Who's Pyotr? His only brother killed in a Klingon raid. His brother? He never had a brother. He's an only child. Sulu, get down to engineering. I see. Security, this is the captain. Find Mr. Chekhov and bring him to the bridge. Captain, why would, why would Chekhov believe he has a brother? I don't know. But he does. And... Now he wants revenge for a non-existent loss. A couple of things about that. That's the line I, I talked about. You know, Sula just sort of gormless. What's, what's the matter with Chekhov? Why is he storming off? Uh, but also, surely in this situation, you would suspect that Sulu was wrong rather than Chekhov. Yeah, or at least check it. Check, yeah. yeah. You wouldn't just accept it. Or oh, Sulu says he's not got a brother, but... Had his brother been violently murdered, that might be the type of thing that you Just don't want to talk about. about so yeah. you, you don't mention him, you say I have an only child because it's too painful or whatever. Yeah, it's possible. Chekhov there reminds me of, I don't know if you've seen the musical Wicked, it's possibly in The Wizard of Oz as well, where 
the wee munchkin guy who's been turned into the tin man says he's going to go off he's got a personal score to settle with the witch okay I've not seen it uh, it's on my list in the corridor we see Chekhov skulk about with his sword as again the swirl follows close by before we head to sickbay yes McCoy's finishing bandaging up uh, this red shirt that we saw attacked earlier and he refers to the Klingons as filthy butchers breaking the rules of war by hacking at men once they're down now, yeah, he's covered in sweat, and this seems a an overreaction because we look at the injured man, and the hardly seems to be a mark on him. He's, he's, not, he's certainly not been butchered. No, he seems absolutely fine. There's also a man in another bed with a bandage on his head, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, a bit like you see in the cartoons. Yes. Is that the man that gets carried in, or is that a different one? Yeah, the other guy gets carried in as well. In auxiliary control, the Klingons are happy to find the schematics of the Enterprise, which were very, very basic. <laughs> yes. And somehow tells them that they've got equal numbers of fighters. Yeah, and they plan to take engineering um, first. Yes, they, they note that this means that it's no longer 40 against 400, they've got a fighting chance. Mm. Down in the armory, or across in the, I don't know where the armory is, Scotty advises via comms to Kirk that it would be pointless trying to free the trapped men as something has happened to make the metal impenetrable. <laughs> okay. And also, all their phasers are swords now. <laughs> So they're hacking at this bulkhead <laughs> with a wee sword. And just as worrying, yeah, all of their all of their weapons are now antiques. Yeah, that's happened here too. Kirk orders Scotty to go back to engineering to re-establish engine control and manufacture some alternative phasers, but he's more enamoured with a different weapon. Yeah, well first of all, I mean, Kirk at this point seems quite deflated. He's thinking, Oh, what's what's happening now? Yeah. What can I do? This is this one is thing after another. Exactly. And also, is it easy just to Fashion up some more phasers. Well, if anyone can do it, Scotty can do it. I suppose they've got the machine that can make food, hasn't it? You say, give me some chicken soup, and then yeah. it just appears. Phaser, please. Yeah. And it just shoots chicken soup. Tell me about Scotty's new weapon. He spotted a flamboyantly decorated claymore. Yeah, which he handles with a smile, and he calls it a beauty. I don't even know. Is that a claymore? I believe it is. Is it? Okay. Or one type of. Right. I think he claims it for his own here. He does. Back to the bridge, a concerned Kirk then confides in Spock that he doesn't know what's going on. And he responds by saying that scans show they are now equally matched with the Klingons in terms of numbers and territory. So they're just finding out what the Klingons already knew. Yeah, then Spock makes a bizarre observation about there being more life energy units on board than the crew and the Klingons. Are what's a life energy unit when it's at home? Well, I don't know, it's just, I suppose, it's a, a scan, there's, there's something there, isn't it? It's got, there's an energy there. Yeah, it's it's excess, been... biological, something or other. Kirk asks if it's additional Klingons. And he says he'll go and check. And as he does, in engineering, we see the entity hover unnoticed as Scotty joins Sulu with his sword. And he is told there are no sign of any Klingons. Yep, so they head into engineering where Scotty talks to some engineers at which point they're immediately jumped by some Klingons. Yeah, they creep in, launch this attack. It's a sort of a wrestling team where he launches himself off the top deck of the yeah. engineering room to pile drive with these guys. And they seem to win this quite easily. Scotty accepts that they have now gained control of engineering and instructs Sulu and a red shop to, this has seemed a bit odd, to split up and meet back at the bridge. Why? I don't know, but they do, at least Sulu and Scotty get to the bridge eventually and never mention the fact that they were trying to meet back at the bridge. Scooby-Doo stuff. Here, let's, yeah. all, no, let's all stay together. Power and numbers and all that. Nope, split up. We then see the Klingons salute Kang, Mara and that other chap with shouts of victory as they appear in front of them. Yes, and Spock now is in a position to provide Kirk with important new news. What's that? It's not additional Klingons, a different alien is on board. A single entity. And Kirk asks the computer for more information. Yeah, because he wants to make contact with it. The computer immediately tells them that it is made of pure energy, but has intelligence and an undetermined purpose. That's right. So Kirk and Spock put their heads together and try to work out what's going on. Yeah, they come up with a, a theory that it is manipulating matter and their minds and is now taking them out of the galaxy, but why? And Spock says they can't rely on their own memories at this stage because the entity manipulates those as well. So Kirk decides they need to bury the hatchet with Kang, which Spock considers to be an appropriate turn of phrase. Yes, but he also thinks it'll be difficult to achieve. Understandably so, yeah. A very shouty McCoy shows up to declare that this is a crazy idea 
and they should wipe out every one of them. Yeah, a little bit like last week, where Kirk was insistent in trying to uh, negotiate with the the Erps. Yes, it's like no, why? Why, why? All of a sudden, stop negotiating with everybody. Kirk points out that the alien is the main threat, but McCoy says they're acting like fools and they should begin to behave like military men. Yeah, I think that was just after Ahura interrupted to tell him that there were uh, more injured men requiring his attention. Yeah, he's on his way out at that stage. And then we hear from Kang. Yeah, he comes through to let them know that they have now taken engineering and therefore life support systems. Yeah, so they've turned them off. Yeah, on all areas apart from obviously the ones where they are. And we see the lights go out to illustrate this. And they let them know that they're going to die of suffocation. Not want to waste too much oxygen, Kirk decides to record a log. Yes, yeah, detailing <laughs> the perilous state there. And I suppose that's probably um, protocol. Yes. He sends Sulu uh, to emergency manual control. Uh, is, I've never heard of this before. Is this a place? I guess so, down a Jeffrey's tube somewhere. But I don't know why they don't have it on the bridge. Exactly. <laughs> Something really so more convenient. Yeah. A big button on the wall. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he used to go there and try and protect life support and auxiliary power. He leaves as an angry Scotty enters. Very angry Scotty. He tells Kirk he's jeopardised the Federation. Yeah, and he's ranting about the, the fuzz-faced goons. Yeah, they've just got beards. They're not particularly fuzzy. No. But things get worse than that in terms of the insults. Yes, well, Spock tries to calm Scotty down and they get involved in a back and forth. He tells him to get his Vulcan hands off, calls him a, a half-breed. He does, that's quite rude. It is. Now, this is probably a, an appropriate time to discuss, you know, what we come to learn, I think, is that the the energy is magnifying the deep-seated feelings and perhaps... Um, Existing prejudices. Exactly. So, yeah, it's not it's not a great look, and especially when it comes to Chekhov in a, a moment as well. But So we find out that Scotty is just a, a, a massive racist who's been trying to, to, to cover it up and hide it all this time. I think there's some suggestion though that these are not real feelings because Spock starts saying how terrible it is to work with humans and Kirk's response is to point out, but you're part human. As if, you know, yeah. you don't really hate humans, you are kind of human. Maybe, maybe. I prefer to think that it's just bringing out the... Their natural feelings. The natural feelings, yeah. <laughs> they grab at each other and Kirk has to break them apart by snapping at Spock, which seems to provide a, a, cla a clarity to their situation. What are we saying? What are we doing to each other? Fascinating. The result of stress. We've been under stress before. It's never set us at each other's throats. What? This is war! There isn't any war! Or is there? Have we forgotten how Scotty. to defend ourselves? What's happening to us? We've been trained to think in other terms than war. We've been trained to fight its causes if necessary. Then why are we behaving like a group of savages? Look at me. Look at me. Two forces aboard the ship, each of them equally armed. Has a war been staged for us? complete with weapons and ideology and patriotic drum beating even spark even race hatred recent events would seem to be directed toward a magnification of the basic hostilities between humans and klingons apparently it is by design that we fight we seem to be pawns. But what's the game? And whose? And what are the rules? It is most urgent that we locate the alien entity immediately and determine its motives and a method for halting its activities. That was some good shattering there. But I get the feeling he thinks he's performing Shakespeare half the time. Yeah. Well, at least he's putting the effort in. It's just as um, memorable. More memorable, probably. Yeah. At this point, we hear back from Sulu. Yeah, he is reporting no progress, just as the systems come back on. And he, I suppose, quite um, honestly uh, admits that it wasn't him. I would be more uh, inclined to say, yep, yeah, no, when, when getting the, the, the praise and the thanks, and yeah, no, no worries, guys. I put myself in a bit of danger there, physical <laughs> danger, but uh, I'm glad I could have helped. We get a, a look down in engineering at the Klingons who note 
through Mara that life support has been restored on the other decks. Yet Kang is confused and assumes that Kirk is behind this and wants to cut off their power at their main life support coupling. Yes, and we had briefly see Spock scanning for the alien, they've now got the ability to scan the ship and as Kang orders Mara, who takes another man with her, off to this main coupling, Spock confirms that the alien is near engineering, so he and Kirk grab their swords and head off. In the corridor, Chekhov is still creeping about and hides in wait when he hears Mara and the other chap coming along. He sneak attacks from behind to disable this other Klingon, potentially kill him, I'm not entirely sure. Certainly knocked out. And takes Mara prisoner against a wall. Yeah, now he decides against killing her, which at first you might think, yeah, well, fair enough, but there's a reason for that. He's a creep and a pervert. Well, he's about to rape her. Yes, he rips her top. It's quite audible, that, the, the, the noise. I, I certainly noticed it. Yeah. He covers her mouth. And before he can do anything more, is stopped by Kirk. Yeah, he gives him a, a well-deserved backhander which knocks him out. Spock then stops him, doing more damage to Chekhov, which I would have said, you know, give him a, give him a 30 seconds at yeah. it. He tries to point out that it's not Chekhov's fault, but whose fault is it then? Mm. He then stands up and tells Mara about the entity. And in an agitated state, he begs for a, a temporary truce. She doesn't respond, so he tells Spock to take her away. Yeah, he grabs her by the arm and Kirk starts to worry about Chekhov and takes him to sickbay. Yeah, he carries him like a baby. He's the way a, he behaves. He's a wee chap, yeah. And we see again the entity follow behind. So, in sickbay, Kirk brings Chekhov in and after McCoy scans him, he diagnoses him as having paranoid mania. And I think this is a m moment of clarity for McCoy. Because he sees all these other terrible injuries miraculously healing and he listens to Spock and Kirk discuss the issue further. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point they, they all sort of admit they've been behave, behaving badly. I think they, they say they're behaving like, uh, they've been behaving like animals. Yeah, McCoy comes through with a wholehearted apology. And Spock sympathised with him, having also felt the surge of hatred and racial bigotry. And from this, Spock deduces that the entity wants them kept alive and suggests that that both they and the Klingons are being tested by it and they've got designs on their their competitive powers and their, their psychologies, their emotions. There's still no indication that Mara believes any of it so Kirk determines that they must find the alien and bring her with them to prove it to her. And as they leave we see one of the patients, is it Johnson? Yes. Yeah, one of the red shirts, regain consciousness, although from the look on his face it may not be an entirely positive thing. Well, no, because now out in the corridor we see the alien up ahead of them glowing red and Johnson follows, having discharged himself from sickbay. Spock isn't able to identify it with his tricorder. And then, as you mentioned there, John, we get a bit of a jump scare because he appears right behind Kirk. Yeah, and he refuses Kirk's order to return to sickbay because he has his orders. Yeah, well, he's got a, so a score to settle. Oh yeah, he believes his orders are kill all the Klingons. However, he is quickly uh, incapacitated by a, a, a nerve pinch or a neck pinch by Spock. Yeah, this causes the alien to change colour and Spock observes this. Yeah, although we should say as well, he drew his sword against Kirk. Uh, Johnson did. Yeah. Yeah, because he wasn't letting him go and kill Klingons. Mm -hmm. Having spotted the change in the colouring of the alien, Spock concludes, along with Kirk, that it exists on the hatred of others. And he confirms that it has been the catalyst for the animosity between them and the Klingons. It's a way of, of feeding it. Yes, they conclude that they must end all hostilities immediately. So to attempt to do this, Kirk communicates with Kang, but for some reason, Mara shouts out that it is a trick. I don't know why. Because she's an idiot. She is an idiot, yeah. And I mean, is she maybe still under the influence of this thing? That's why. possible. And... When Kang doesn't answer, Spock points out that the alien is uh, affecting his mind and soon none will be able to resist. Yes, and then we get Scotty on comms from the bridge with yet more bad news. What's that? Well, to put a time limit on things, the <laughs> dilithium crystals are deteriorating, they can't stop the process, and they have 12 minutes. Coincidentally, so does the episode. <laughs> the entity moves off, 
and at this Kirk ponders the future of drifting in space with constant hatred among them and, ask Ma and asks Mara if she believes him now. I'm not sure what's changed that would make no, Mara... She, she saw the alien entity. She didn't believe it then. And now Scotty says the crystals are breaking down. She'll suddenly believe... I don't think there's any Doesn't make sense, that. no. We've got a nice uh, Captain's Log here. What was the star date? Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> Star date, oh for goodness sake <laughs> You can't do that When they look at the when Starfleet commander ever looks at the, the logs Let's say you're at it here Yeah Proper star date, Kirk Format and Yeah Armageddon, that means <laughs> nothing to us He says they have to find a way to defeat the alien force of hate And stop the war now or spend eternity in futile bloody violence Yeah, just basically a recap of what we know Kirk and Spock bring Mara onto the bridge As Scotty tells him that there is no change with the crystals Kirk is determined that the only solution is talking to Kang. But with time running out, Spock suggests the use of a threat. Yeah, I don't think there's any reason to think this will work, but none whatsoever. Kirk tries it. He says he'll kill Mara in five seconds if Kang doesn't talk to him. And Kang says, yeah, she's a victim of war, she'll understand. I don't think the threat of killing someone's wife is a great means of trying to reduce hatred and emotion. No, or to persuade them to cooperate with you no cooperate with us under threat that's not cooperation indeed but when she finds out that they in fact have no intention of killing her it seems her mind has changed so this was no trick it's the alien that's done this we're in its power our people and yours we only wanted to stop the fighting to save us all we have always fought we must we are hunters captain Tracking and taking what we need. There are poor planets in the Klingon systems. We must push outward if we are to survive. There's another way to survive. Mutual trust and help. I will help you now. How? I will take you to Kang. I will add my voice to yours. I wouldn't trust her, Captain. We can't get through the Klingon defenses in time. Unless... Spock. Intraship beaming. From one section to another, it's possible. It has rarely been done because of the danger involved. Pinpoint accuracy is required. If the transportee should materialize inside a solid object, a deck or a wall... Even if it could work! Wait, she may be leading you into a trap! We're all in a trap. This is the only way out. We'll go with you. No. That'll start the final battle. <laughs> I believe her. Once they're gone, Scotty says to Spock that there's no way she can guarantee that Kang will listen. And Spock's like, yeah, fair enough. Well, I think he says that, yeah, no one can guarantee the actions of another. I'm not sure if I 100% accept that. I mean, you literally have people called guarantors. Yeah. <laughs> In the transporter room, Spock is set up remotely and Kirk gets on the pads with Mara. But before he leaves, he decides to... He disarms himself. Mm. Engineering. Yes, Kirk and Mara gatecrash the party. And Kirk is about to be attacked until she insists that he's come in peace and they must talk. He asks for a one minute, but Kang strikes him and there is a struggle as he demands to know what they've done to her undermined. Yes, because Mara intervenes and blocks Kang's attack. And, and then this is... No, a little bit. Uh, he notices her uh, ripped dress, and rather than be sympathetic to her, I think he he says something along the lines of, "Ah, oh, well, we know why you weren't killed, any eh? you slut." Essentially, she explains though that she is unharmed; she wasn't um, mistreated. But Kang moves her aside anyway. Yeah, wasn't a great look from him there. No, he just wants to attack. He's under the influence of this bright red, by now alien. Okay. Mara chucks a sword to Kirk so he can defend himself. And during this fight, Kirk tries to explain about the entity as the alien itself watches on. Out in the corridor, we see reinforcements arrive and there is a, a running battle. Uh, yes, Spock and McCoy are leading the charge for the, the Federation and the Klingons are defending their position. Kirk seems to be getting the upper hand as he has his sword at Kang's chest. When they turn and they, they see the entity, Yes, and rather than finish Kang off, Kirk gives him a blast of full shat. 
He urges him to end the violence and end the perpetual war. Yeah, he says that, um, he throws away his sword and he admits that he, he won't stay dead. I don't think we discussed that. Well, we didn't highlight it as much. We mentioned that people who had these horrific wounds were recovering. Yeah. So Kirk points out that, yeah, you know, you might kill me, but I'll come back to life and then I'll kill you and you'll come back to life and it'll just be a, you know, an eternity. Or not eternity, they'll die shortly, but, um, or will they? That's the thing. If you can keep bringing someone back to life, will they actually live forever? Well, I think that's what they're concerned about. And Kang says, let's test this by chopping you up. However, he seems to be becoming round when Mara begs him to listen to Kirk. And he finally, he himself agrees to throw down his own weapon, claiming that Klingons kill for their own purposes. Yes, yeah, not under influence. Spock reminds Kirk that all violence needs to end now, so he and then Kang get on the shipwide intercom to call for everyone to stand down. And despite being under the influence of a ragey alien, they do. Yeah, and then I'm not really happy with how this ends here. It's a little bit uh, slaps a little bit comic book. This is actually um, stolen by J.K. Rowling later. Was it? For Harry Potter. Don't tell me, I'm only on book f five. That's in book three. Oh yeah, I can't remember it. You don't remember how they get rid of a bogger? Ah yeah, okay, sure yeah. Literally lifted directly from this. Yeah. Where they laugh at the alien to get it to leave. Yeah, that's it. They all, yeah, they all sort of mock it and laugh at it and McCoy joins in I think, or uh, yeah. Yeah, even Kang starts laughing. Go on, get out of here, sling your hook, you yeah. pathetic creature. And it's so mortified it sails off outside the Enterprise and disappears. Satisfying ending? No. Well, nah. it, it seemed quite rushed. Were you relieved that the ending didn't involve Kirk seducing Mara? Yeah, I mean, that's a... Uh, that was one the obvious of, twist. One of the few times, yeah, he didn't think to himself, I know how I can sort this. <laughs> <laughs> pull, it, pull it back up. Unite the clans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the end, I think they're all slapping each other's backs, aren't they? Ho, oh, oh, aren't we great? And then it disappears and they go back to fighting themselves. Yeah, probably. How well, do what, do, well, what do they do then? Because they've not got a ship anymore. Yeah, do they have to drop them off somewhere. Drop them off and it's like, they're all sort of, thanks for that, yeah, not talking, a bit embarrassed. Leave them with the Romulan commander yeah. from... Wait, wait, I can take you right home. No, no, just, just drop me off, whatever, next, it's fine, it's fine. I can take you right home, it's not a problem. <laughs> How do you think Kang measured up to Kor and Koloth? Um, so Kor was Errand of Mercy, mm -hmm. when they had the Organians and he was the leader there, and then Koloth was the one in Tribbles. Yeah, I, mean, I think he was comparable. I think he had the right level of anger and uh, violence that you could tell that he wanted to unleash. Any other thoughts? Just that it was a, it was a good episode. It was good. Not, not particularly happy with the, the ending, but it was a good episode overall. And I think, again, it just shows that season three is probably the, the strongest so far. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's what most people think. Well, based on the evidence. Yeah. Some trivia? Sure. Okay, so this originally aired on the first day of November in 1968. It was directed by Martin, sorry, Marvin Chomsky, who previously directed And the Children Shall Lead. This was the second of three for him, all in the third season. You hear more about him on that podcast. Jerome Bixby was the writer, third of his four episodes. You'll remember him probably mostly from his first episode, which was Mirror Mirror. If you go back to season one, you can hear the podcast for that, where we talk about him a little bit more. Michael and Sarah played Kang. He would go on to reprise... Two, sorry, two people. Yeah, Michael and Sarah. He would go on to reprise the role in both Deep Space Nine and on Voyager, as well as playing a different Deep Space Nine character. He also appeared in shows like I Dream of Jeannie, Murder, She Wrote, and The Lone Ranger. He died in 2013 when he was 91. Susan Howard played Mara. This was her only Star Trek appearance, but she's a Golden Globe and Primetime Emmy nominee and is best known for her long-term role in Dallas. Yeah. She also appeared in shows like Petrocelli and one episode of Columbo, where she played Shirley Wagner opposite Robert Culp in The Most Crucial Game. Oh, there you go, yeah. Makes her this week's connection. And she's now 77 years old. She's only in her 20s when they made this. This is the only episode of the original series with intraship beaming, although it's in one of the new style movies at least, and it later becomes commonplace in the other series. The original plan for this episode was to reuse Core. But uh, John Colicus was unavailable, so the new captain was created. The alien effect that we thought was familiar was actually created specifically for this episode with a child's windmill. Okay. But it was kind of sped up and effects were put on it to make it appear alien. I can see that, yeah. Kang is one of the aliens that the... Uh, so he's one of the aliens on The Simpsons. 
it's named after this character. The other is obviously named after Kodos. Oh, yeah, the two. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, and in terms of international titles, just a couple to mention. In Italian, this was La Forza dell'Odio, meaning the power of hate. Um, yeah. In Japan, they went for Ushu no Kai Ikari Oku, which I think translates as something along the lines of mystery in space, eat away the anger. Okay. <laughs> Fine. The book I had uh, translated it as Eat Out the Anger, but I think that's a different thing altogether. Yeah, let's not go there. Yeah, you're not going to make it happy. Next time, it's the eighth episode of season three for The World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. Have which you? is not going to fit in any of our graphics. Oh, and uniquely has a title that is longer than the episode itself. <laughs> okay. And between now and then, you can find us all over social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram with the handle at Trek Podcast. We're on YouTube where we put up every episode and also our website, astartrekpodcast.com, where you can find posts for each and every show and leave your thoughts, views, reminiscences, and pick fights with other Star Trek lovers. Until then, cheerio. Bye bye.